I'm doing well. How are you doing, Kim? Good. And did I hear you take a gulp before we went live? <laughs> are you seriously drinking beer in the afternoon? Drinking beer in the middle of the day. What's a down and dirty show without the beer? Oh, you're my baby brother. I love it. I love oh, it. I know. I know. We're, we're cut from the same cloth. <laughs> How are you doing, Kim? Good, good, good. How are you doing? I feel like I haven't talked to you forever. About a week. About a week. Uh, we, we, you know, we flirt back and forth a little via messenger, but we only get a chance to really talk once a week. And then usually we have like some, you know, rude guest coming in and, and interrupting our conversations. And it's, ah, yeah. we, we don't get everything off our chest, but I'm looking forward to actually getting a chance to sit down and talk to you next week. I'm pumped. So pumped. Uh-oh. Yeah, keep it. Hang on for next week because it's just you and I next week. Uh, just the two of us, you and I? Yeah, just <laughs> well, you and I. As much as I am excited for that, I am so much more excited, no offense, for today's show. Yeah. Because if anyone is going to interrupt me, I want it to be this man right here. Manny Wolf, man. He's one of my favorite people <laughs> online. I love the guy. I, I'm secretly crushing on him, I think. Um, truth be told, this is the kind of guy where you sit down, he opens his mouth and you automatically feel like once you finish a conversation with him, you feel like you need to have a smoke. Like, <laughs> <laughs> wow. Oh my God. I can't wait for this show. Uh, boy, our guests can do that real quickly. We're broadcasting live at bold radio station. We have a cool producer, Nesha, who is serving us ice cold beer. Nesha, make sure, um, in my blue moon, I want double, um, orange slices, please. I'm a little, I need that extra vitamin C today. Um, <laughs> so Scott, take it yeah. away. I want to bring Manny out ASAP. All right. Sounds good. Without any further hesitation, I don't like to do bios. Anything I can say about Manny, Manny can so say better about himself, but this yeah. guy is one of the coolest cats I've ever gotten the chance to talk with, you know, online. We met online. Just, just fucking love the guy. Honestly, Manny, man, how are you doing? Ah, oh, man, I'm doing good today. And uh, I'm doing great after that that intro. That intro <laughs> sounds bio. Shit, yeah. Yeah, uh, yeah. <laughs> so this, this will not be the interview where I suddenly have uh, no pizzazz and no style. <laughs> <laughs> well, the way I see it, man, is if, if you ever drop pizzazz and style, I, I'd be shocked. <laughs> I've never seen you off your game, not once. So I'm really, really pumped about this. <laughs> and I, I feel like it's because you're actually yourself. You know, when people put up fronts and they pretend to be someone else, you catch them off guard at times and they're, they, they kind of fucking shock you. But with you, I don't think there's ever been a moment where you haven't been yourself. And that's what excites me about this. Yeah, that's actually um... – It's funny. It's not only is that true. I was going to say, I can't wait until we connect at an event or something because then you can actually actually see me on my game. Right. I don't know. (laughs) um, It's weird that you say that when you did, though, because, man, I have, uh, you know, I lately, obviously not related to you or to uh, the frisky Kim Boudreau Smith, but. uh, (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> Lately, I've been having that experience where some of my sort of, um, I want to call them maybe my mentor slash heroes, you know, um, have really, it's its like I've been getting this opportunity that I didn't ask for to sort of go backstage and see them with half their, half their stage makeup on before mm-hmm. they're sort of in character. And it's been, yeah. it's been this really weird kind of like, are you fucking kidding me? it's really been a it's been a trip man um and you know everybody knows now that um in in the online world we sure talk a oh god we talk a good fucking game about being authentic don't we oh man i wanted to bust your chops about that oh my god he opened oh he opened up the door for you scott (laughs) we do we do authenticity it's such a fucking buzzword it drives me insane man yeah. And, you know, so here's the thing about authenticity, though. I just want to I just want to drive a stake into the ground on this one. OK, some marketing bullshit is marketing bullshit. And uh, and I even heard must have been six months ago now. Somebody just I, I wish I could credit this quote to where it goes, but I don't know the girl who said it. It just showed up in my feed. She said authenticity is the new bullshit. Oh, and yeah. I just think that that's solid gold because um you know, I I met and then was influenced by and followed some some people that are really doing cool shit. 
You know, they're really doing cool stuff, but it's just the nature. I honestly, I think it's the nature of the way I was raised. I'm always the first one to see through the bullshit. You know, I'm always the first one to call the emperor out when I see that his new clothes are dot, 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 whatever. Yeah. Um, <laughs> and, and that's been the experience I've just been having this last week. And so it's funny that you, you say it, you say what you did when you did about me never being off my game, because that's, that's actually true, man. It's, I'm just being the same. In fact, I'm being a step down version of the same guy that you'll meet whenever we connect at a, at a conference or something. It's yeah. not, it's not an act, you know, it's, uh, for better or for worse, it's just who the fuck I am. So, um, yeah. <laughs> yeah, man. And I, I've got to agree. And I know Kim is 100% on par with this. We've talked about it many a time. The yeah. online world is a lot of smoke and mirrors. Either people blow themselves up really big or they yeah. dumb themselves down really low. And I yeah. found myself kind of taking um, the second approach where I'm really like larger than life, flipping people off uh, on interviews, laughing my ass off, swearing all yeah. the time. But because my show was educational, I had to tone that down a lot. And I've saw Kim as well doing her uh, real chats with Kim about the business stuff. And she was such like a shadow of her usual self. There was, you know, mm. cause and, and Kim feel free to cut me off and, and cuss me out for this. But I remember getting back to your show and saying a lot of wisdom, but I'm not believing it. Like I'm not following you here. This isn't really you. You're, you're so quiet compared to who you really are. Yeah, different shows than than what we have here on Wednesday um, to Monday. But yeah, no, I remember you saying that. And I want to add into what was just said by um, Manny um, is, um, you know, it's interesting how people think they can buy authenticity. It's interesting how people (laughs) think that they can buy spirituality or it's it's interesting what people think that they can buy. And you know what? I'm going to tell you something. And yeah, I'm going to say this live on the air. 90, I think it used to be 98%, but in my world, I'm going to raise it to about 99% of those peeps out there on social media are fucking liars and they're fraudulent people and they don't have a pot to piss in. And, and you know what? And I think, I think, um, I don't like calling people dumb or stupid. So I'll start with ignorant and then we'll go into (laughs) stupidity. Do people not remember what they say? And then they go and they put the opposite out there on Facebook. Like, Oh, I can't feed my kids today. Look at my refrigerator. It's jam packed. I can't even fucking close the doors. It's like, what? I mean, are you really that like dumb and numb? I mean, oh my God. So yeah, I mean, it's interesting what's going on out there with people. And um, it does. It either allows people to blow themselves up to be what they're not. And and yeah. and everybody, the majority of those people, that, that 98, 99% of people, they're wannabes. What did um, Mark Mawinney call it um, to you one time, Scott? And I forgot to write the word down. Um, oh, God. Um, he, he, he called them cheaple. 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 <laughs> cheaple. I yeah. love it. Cheaple. I got to write that down. Cheaple. Like cheaple. <laughs> yeah. Mark called them cheaple. He said they're, they're all these people who, who claim they have, you know, six figures or seven figure incomes. But then right. when they come to you for a skill and you put your, your fee on the line, they run away and you never hear from them again. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. There's, there's all of that you could ask for and more. Yeah. So Manny, I feel yes, like we, we're going off on a tangent here, but on the pre-call, you were just about to get into yes. something that I'm salivating because I want to hear it that bad. You were talking about your circus sideways shitstorm life <laughs> and how that how that has brought you to where you are now. Can you kind of backtrack a little bit and share that with the audience since we're talking about authenticity? We're talking about you always being on your game. You mentioned how you were raised and how you can see through bullshit. Let's talk, dude. Why? How'd this happen? <laughs> so <laughs> I feel like I could tell this story in my sleep now um, because actually, you know what? Let's start here. Before I wrote the book that that is ostensibly the reason we're talking, Scott, I know that we would find any any excuse to connect on an interview, but ostensibly it's because I got this book coming out. You're using um, me? No, <laughs> <laughs> I love it when people use one another on this show, down and dirty. 
Yeah, so, yeah. down and dirty. <laughs> Bef- you never let you somebody wrote- take you. You never let someone take you out to dinner before just because you were hungry. Yeah, <laughs> actually. <exactly. laughs> on on the show I'm about to launch, Mark literally said he called me a whore on the show because he said you were letting everybody fuck you before you let before you even asked for dinner. So it's <laughs> funny that you said that. <laughs> I just so want anyway. to go on record here as saying um, I have a soft spot because of, again, because of the way I was raised for, for people who feel that way. So I'm yeah. not judging. I'm not judging anybody who <laughs> went one time or another, let me fuck them before I bought them. <laughs> <laughs> I'm surrounded by testosterone today. Yes. And, bring and on. that is, and that is why you're on the show today. It has nothing yes. to do with your book. <laughs> So, all right, man. The book. Let's talk. The way that I was raised. Yeah. Um, f- shit. Uh, so I was born into a cult, and usually that's that's where the the brakes lock up for people. Um, you know, that's usually where I get the head turn and the what what the what did he just say? Uh, I so I was born into a cult, and I have uh, I have since figured out that there are different degrees of intensity within cults, and so mine wasn't like. Um, you know, Jonestown. It wasn't like um the the fucking people that all put on the Nikes and took, you know, put took a, a poison together. Yeah, but, drink the purple, drink the purple soda, man. Yeah, yeah, but it was um, it it was enough to thoroughly monkey wrench me. And here's the thing, too. This is so funny because I see this all the time in in now that I'm an adult and I actually. And, you know, I have children in my care. Um, I see that what adults can think of um, sort of, uh, I'm going to say, concepts that adults can see the edges of, right? Like they they know this is just a concept I'm playing with. When you When you sort of recklessly engage in those concepts, beliefs, attitudes, behaviors around children, the difference is children don't know that it's just a concept they're playing with. Mm. And so um, for me growing up being born into, and you know, (laughs) from the moment I opened my eyes the first time they just downloaded my, my pristine little hard drive to quote Bill Burr uh, with all kinds of shit that nobody ever told me, Hey, this is just one way of looking at things. You know what I mean? It's like, yeah. and so as as a kid, when you're like a, a a big part of what I do now has to do with um uh the effects that that uh like how do we get those things in our childhood that that anchor us and that shape the way we see the world, right? And and a lot of it is because as children you rely on whatever adults are present, you bond with them and you rely on them. And, and it's like everything they do, everything they don't do, everything they say, everything they don't say, all of it, be, it makes up your, your, um, your world, your reality, your version of God, if you will. Right. So mm-hmm. your parents are your first model for God. Um, <clears throat> I was taught some really, really We'll just say counterintuitive things, <laughs> counterproductive <laughs> thought processes. For instance, I was I was indoctrinated with the idea that um, money was the chief instrument of Satan that Satan was using to overthrow the world, to destroy the planet. I mean, it was it was more than that. Money is evil, sort of, you know, lukewarm, tepid, middle of the road. Uh, noble poverty consciousness thing. It was way deeper than that. It was, wow. Uh, wow. yeah, it was like, it was almost to the point, what I actually, what I associated it with was like a hot stove coil. You know, I, I did, I, I, it took me years, decades to un, to unravel that. But what I associated money with basically like putting your hand on a hot stove. Don't touch it. Stay away from it. Stay yep, the yep, fuck yep. away from it. Yep. And so, that mixed with the fact that everybody was freely and liberally getting high on all kinds of like, you know, whatever it was, alcohol, pot, psychedelics. Um, and it's, so it's a hop, skip and a jump from those things to cocaine and, and methamphetamines and pills and that. So what I did was I learned very quickly to trade money for those things because those are the things I saw 
everyone in my reality doing and being happy with. And I saw money as being this thing that was dangerous and bad. Right. And, and guess what happens when you do start to drink? It does make you happy. You guys know shit. You're drinking right now. (laughs) Yeah, (laughs) that's true. I am right now at this moment. But so, so it's a, there's actually a, a point in my book where I say, um, one generation's lip service can become another generation's true north, right? And that's what it was for me. It's like I took everything that I was exposed to as the absolute reality. And so we lived in the Haight-Ashbury, which I don't know if either of you know where oh, that is. Oh, yes. We were just there in the fall. Yes. Oh, okay. Great. So that's where we were born. And, um, you know, if the if the hippies had won – it would have been a different situation. My whole life would have been different because yep. I was raised to be, you know, a product of that culture. Right. Mm-hmm. Uh, and I mean, I was a distilled product of that culture. I was the essence of that culture. Uh, but they didn't, as we know. Um, and so we moved one day when I was about eight years old from the Haight Ashbury district where In California, there was no place you'd be more welcome if you were, you know, a little hippie child who was born in a cult. We probably had, and I'm just guessing, this is just off the top of my head, there must have been five or six cults within a 10-mile radius. I mean, it was not, it was not unusual, you know, Um, but for some reason, and it's funny, I don't think I have any other blocked memories in my life. I really don't. But we as a group, the whole cult I was in, all 60 of us, one day we up and moved from the relative safety and the relative normalcy of the environment we lived in, virtually, Kim, by the way, uh, right one block away from the corner of the Haight-Ashbury sign. So it was just the epicenter. You know what I mean? Wow. And uh, (laughs) we moved to the middle again (laughs) of this time, a Mexican ghetto in Stockton, California. And um, the word ghetto these days gets thrown around a lot. (laughs) Yes. Oh, man. I'm just going to take a moment here. (laughs) No worries. No worries. Um, So we, I don't know, there's almost a, there's almost a sense of pride in in trying to claim that you were raised in the ghetto or or raised in the hood. Let me tell you what the hood I actually was raised in was like. When we pulled in, in our Technicolor painted buses and, and and (laughs) I'm not kidding. This is, this is, this is legit true. Okay. This is a hundred percent spot on. We had, we had, um, campers, VW vans, I think. There was a school bus and all of them had big slogans painted on them and, and flying saucer <laughs> clouds. And right. I mean, it was, <laughs> this was the best time ever in- <laughs> to be alive. See, Scott, this is way before your time. You know that. I don't think unfortunately, you- unfortunately, but it's, it's, it also the way Manny describes it sounds like it yes. might've been a lot of fun. And very oh yeah, scary all at once. Yeah, so you, you know it depends. It just depends. Um, and again, I say if the hippies had won, you know, I might not have found myself with uh, with three deep and intense double binds sort of baked into my my emotional psychology. But I did because they didn't. So anyway. Yeah. <laughs> we you, pull you, in, you pull into this ghetto. Yeah, we're driving in <laughs> in a caravan and and the buses and shit, they say things on them like get rid of money, worldwide work stoppage, you know, uh one world family commune. It's just it's very um indiscreet, we'll say. <laughs> and and we pull into this city that is all dilapidated houses and you know, Chevelles up on the grass, you know what I mean? Uh, parked in the front lawn and um, guys, guys sitting around the stoops with with uh, 40 ounces in paper bags. And I'll never forget this, you guys. As we pulled in, I was looking out the back window of whatever vehicle I was in. And I remember seeing the Cholos, right, sort of like closing in behind us because <laughs> they don't know what the fuck they're seeing either. You know, nobody <laughs> told them this was coming. And. I remember one guy stands up, he makes eye contact with me and he stands up and he raises his arms up right out of boys in the hood. 
you know, and his flannel shirt that's buttoned at the top opens and I can see a pistol handle in his in his belt. Oh, snap. Wow. Yeah. And, you know, they're like they're circling behind us on their little bicycles. And um, <laughs> it was it was brutal. And so from that day, from that day, pretty much for four years, I went from total acceptance to having to fight every day. Every day, twice a day was about average. Once a day was a slow day. Sometimes it would just get really crazy. You know, I had to, I had to jump into bushes to avoid being run off the sidewalk by cars. Oh my God. It it was, it was fucking nuts. It was fucking nuts. And as a side note, like I've never, remember I said, I've never, I didn't, I haven't blocked any memories out. Yeah. Here's, here's the one that I can't recall. And this is so crazy because I vividly remember living in that neighborhood, as you can imagine. (laughs) But I do not have any recollection of packing up our houses, loading up our vehicles and leaving the Bay Area. None. Like it's just gone. So really, that's interesting. That's really (laughs) interesting. um, It was it was it was moving into a war zone. That's what it was. I mean, the first day I got there, I had to fight. And I remember uh, three or four nine volt batteries, the big, the, you know, the two inch tall round ones, duct taped with a firecracker on them thrown through one of our windows the first day. Oh my God, insane. Yeah, it was, it was crazy. And so you, how did I, we're really actually talking here about how uh, you said, Scott, like I'm never off my game. I'm always authentic. Um, the fact of the matter is I learned how to read people like my life depended on it because it did. Yeah, because it did. Exactly. So I yeah. learned how to, I, I can peg somebody's intent literally from a block away. I mean, and I still can to this day, <clears throat> you know, and it's because I was in what a, what a very kind therapist with many years <laughs> later, call, uh, constant fight or flight mode for four years. Wow. That's insane, man. Well, it's like, how do you land on your feet from all of that? Wow. I mean, my head's spinning right now because I'm, I'm trying to really put myself into your shoes, but, you know, but back up several, you know, of course, several years ago, because this happened a long time ago. Um, yeah. yeah. It's like, how do you, how do you land on your feet from that stuff? Well, if you're me, you have to go a lot deeper down the rabbit hole first, you know, and one of the things I credit with uh with planting the seeds that would ultimately sort of i don't know pull me through that was just by just by happenstance it turns out um i'm i'm kind of tough <laughs> you just and found I, that I, out huh <laughs> well i didn't have a choice in the matter you know um it and i only say that i didn't know that going into that environment you know what i mean i had no idea um, but again, the same therapist, she, she postulated, <laughs> she postulated for me that, um, I had the ability back then. What, what happened was I had the ability to go from pretty much like zero to savage in, in the blink of an eye. And the reason was because there was nobody protecting the little boy. Right. And so <clears throat> not everybody has that, that ability. Uh, this is, this is all stuff she told me. Um, and so fortunately I had that ability. And so that was what that four years looked like. It was just constant fighting all the time, living in constant fear. I'll give you an idea. I could leave. I was a a kid, eight, eight to 12 is when I lived there. And I could walk out the front doors of our house without telling anyone where I was going at nine at night. That's how, that's how sort of un- unaware everyone was you know what i mean i could go out after dark and walk the fucking streets of that ghetto if i so chose wow yeah how old were you when you would just walk out the door at nine o'clock at night well i didn't do that very often okay. but i did do it a few times and that, so that was from eight to twelve you know the only times i would do that um i had there was an, a couple of older kids a little bit older than me who were who were also in the group and two of them sort of uh took me under their wings and it was sort of like a, um, uh, there, there are some good literary 
examples of this kind of thing, but they elude me right now. So basically they protected me, but they also simultaneously made me fight them every day, uh, you know, to quote, toughen me up. Um, and I, and I pretty much never won those fights, but I could go, you know, like, uh, one of the, one of the guy's names was Ian and Ian was, Ian was a singular person. And I actually, I, I divert the topic to him a little bit because it wasn't just on the south side of Stockton that he saved my bacon a bunch of times. He wound up moving over to another part of Stockton, just as I did. And he was sort of my protector for, shit, I guess until I was about 18, 18 or 19. Wow. There were times where I could just use his name and get out of scrapes. You know, <laughs> that's, <laughs> that's how, that's how this guy was. Um. <laughs> so if he was out there hanging on the street corners with uh with the local kids who he won well I wouldn't say he won them over but you know they knew <laughs> after a while you know who not to just mess with you know yeah. you got to choose for battles and so if he was out there I could go out there and so to answer your question Kim if I saw him out there I knew it was safe for me to go you knew out it was there. safe yeah yeah you were going to be pretty- yeah. I can't imagine a young child boy or girl <laughs> living a childhood like that i can actually and and this is something i don't say very often i don't come out and talk about years past but i relate to manny a lot there's a reason i like manny so much i grew up in a military town where there was a lot of conformity and every single kid in that town had something to prove and so there was a lot of violence there was a lot of abuse there was a lot of drugs i was stealing bikes when i was like 10 years old and stripping them down and reselling them and skateboards and things like that like we were horrible kids in retrospect but we just did what we (laughs) you know we did what we did it's just that manny Mm -hmm. lived what i lived times a thousand and so there's a reason why when he gets talking i'm like man that's crazy i love it and hate it all at the same time <laughs> like <laughs> but you know what honestly and i say this with sincerity i i mean this i will stand by this in any group in any context one of the one of the big things that i coach people on so scott you know that ostensibly i coach um delivery i i coach yes. public speaking yes. But really what I coach is a transformed sort of internal picture of yourself that allows you to have the, what it takes to get on stage and burn the fucking house down. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? And, um, like I don't, I'm not a goody two shoes speaking coach. (laughs) I ain't your guy. I ain't your guy. If you want to learn how to, how to present like a, like a newscaster. If you want to learn how to connect to your passion, your rage, your fury, and channel all of those into a message that will move people, then I'm your guy. You know something? I, I gotta. I want to interject here for a minute, um, Manny. Yeah. I was just coming before the interview today. Um, I was just coming out of. Um, I take a Pilates session and this woman was so nice that was walking in after us and she's like hey Kim how was your interview and she was referring to I was interviewed uh, on a radio station here um, locally a couple weeks ago and I'm like oh my god you know it was great and thank you so much for having such a phenomenal memory that that's awesome you know and we were talking and she goes you know what did you like about what you didn't like about it you know one of the things I don't like about FCC regulated governmental bullshit is you're not allowed to you're not allowed to curse and I felt for that 30 minutes I, that I couldn't be me because you know it's like you said yeah. you teach people to burn the house down through the yeah. power of their voice words and and not this like you said this newscaster hello or I'm a politician I've got to say it this way <laughs> even though I really mean it another way or yeah. I'm going to tell to deliver the news yeah. because you know this is my six figure job and I have to play <laughs> by the rules you know I mean I had to play by rules for thirty minutes and it was because when I get in like all three of us sitting here. Um, when I get into some passion, you know, I'm not standing on the top of my roof of my house with a megaphone and going, listen here, you motherfucker. It's <laughs> the fuck will just come out because you I'm should. so passionate. Yeah, thanks. I'm so <laughs> passionate about what it is I'm talking about. And people go, why do you have to say that? 
It's because I'm being serious. I'm being very passionate and, and wholehearted about what I mean. It, you know, the word fuck is just another word for God's sakes, people. It's just another word, you know. So I wanted to jump in there. I love that. I love that because I just spoke a couple months ago at an event and I got up on that stage and F-bombs came out of my mouth and it's, it, it was necessary. I, I, it just came out. It was what I was saying. So and everyone honestly, in the audience was like, <gasps> <laughs> oh, and there, was, there was a room full of women and a lot of the women were like come up afterwards and like oh my god that was amazing thank you so much it's like i gave women the permission to use the word fuck out in public it's like come right. on yeah. it's just a word i mean people and i say this all the time people walk around all day long i hate you i hate this i hate that but you get offended by the word fuck oh my god right <laughs> Right, right, yeah. And one of the things that I love about Manny is he doesn't just he doesn't just teach the speaking part, right, Manny. You go into like um, tonality, you go into actual body language, you go in like you teach the yeah. whole shebang. But the reason why is well, what I'm gathering, and when you and I spoke, you and I just literally talked about. I think we were talking about just a hiccup I was going through. You went all yeah. the way back to yeah. how my mom and I treated each other in my childhood. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, that's right. Because um so the the thing that is so like just just compelling and seductive to me about communication is that you know how if you got two people that are middle aged, you can tell right off which one of them has smoked all their life and which one of them works out. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I'm serious. True. You know what I mean? It's like, so our bodies wear our habits on them, right? And they start to show up, you know, the bad habits start to show up in the late 30s, early 40s, mm-hmm. uh, assuming that the bad habits aren't super intense. Um, so it's the same way with how we communicate. It's the exact same thing. You know, there's there's our idioms that we choose, our habitual inflection patterns, our habitual uh, phrases, our, our word choices. Every little nuance about how we communicate mm-hmm. has been – well, first of all, it's it's language. It's the English language or whatever language we speak. But that could be thought of as like um, one of those like memory foam beds, right? Then all of our little issues are little weights that are sitting on the bed. You know right. what I mean? Yep. And so, so the people that I have the most success with are the people that – a, I can take there without them going, I thought I was learning how to be a public speaker. And B, um, the ones who understand, the ones who are open to that. And yeah, so that's why, Scott, is like, I want to know why. I want to know, you know, I'll get women. I coach women a lot. And women, by and large, when I, I mean, I don't know that I've had a statistically relevant sample, but I find that the uh, that the women that I coach often have trouble making their voices sexy, and I find that fascinating, you know. Um, and so, Kim, here's what I here in a nutshell. Here's here's one of the pieces I teach. You want to be able to move your vocal tonality from behind your teeth, like I'm speaking now, mm-hmm. back into back into your voice like this, mm. right? So it's, so so it goes back into your throat, and when you're speaking from behind the teeth, that's expository. That's when you're you're being emphatic and you're stating factual stuff. And, and this is just a rule of thumb for the movement. But when you want to be seductive and bring people over to your way of thinking, then you kind of want to just drop it back in your throat a little bit. Kind of oh. bring them in. You see what I'm oh, saying? I like that. Yeah, I like that. <laughs> and what I find is that men – Again, painting with a broad brush, men will jump right here. You know what I mean? <laughs> Hi, I'm, I'm Scott. How's it going? Yeah, but but it's so weird because they do it in this like overly exaggerated way. I call it where, peacocking. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Well, that's what they're doing. They, they, they're peacocking. And women <clears throat> uh, sometimes have a real hard time getting past right here, right? The break in their, in their voice, the bridge yep. is what it's called. Yep. And they can't get down in here, you know, they can't be like, so inevitably when I find that, it's like, well, let's talk about your childhood. Let's talk about your sex life. Let's talk about, you know, not your sex life, but your sexual identity. You know, do you have a problem being seductive? Do you have uh, what was your mom like? What was your dad like? And it always, always, always connects. It always connects. 
You're a Which psychologist, I, for God's sakes. A well, psychologist to speaking. <laughs> Why do you think I was so horny to get him on the show? Like, oh, my God. <laughs> that's it. Like, Where's this our guy, dominatrix girl at? Come right, on. This right? would have been a great show. <laughs> I've, I've, I've had two phone calls with Manny. We've spoken a few times online. He asked me to jump onto his book launch, which I can't wait to start talking about here in a bit. And, you know, we've shared pictures back and forth. By the way, Manny, fucking stellar outfit when you used to play bass, man. That picture you shared to me, I felt like I felt like you were my righteous soul, brother. Like, awesome. <laughs> that was beautiful. And the hair, though. Like, that, the, yeah. you defied gravity. But I, I thought that was superb. But, like, this is the kind of relationship we have. It's I, I call it, like, passive flirtation. In passing, we'll throw each other the occasional, hey, what's up? And, and the ribbing. Like, when I finally went public with my relationship, you were like, oh, the one you went public about eight weeks ago? <laughs> you know, that kind of thing. But the main reason I was stoked to get Manny on the show is that the two times that we spoke, I came out of that call and both times he was like, I don't know why we're talking. You've already got a handle on it. You know what you're up against. You know how to fix that. But both times we spoke, I sat there after dumbfounded. And one of them, I had two glasses of wine. And by the time I was finished that call, sober, instantly sober, (laughs) because I was just sitting there blinking and thinking. And that's all I could do for probably a good 20, 20 minutes after just blinking and thinking and just mulling the conversation over in my head because the guy, like, man, you tapped right into, like, things that I didn't even think about. Like, I I, bar- I either buried them or just went, not important, and forgot right. about them, right? right? Yeah. Which and, is, I love that. Which is I what we do. Yeah, yep, yep. Even, I mean, that that's assuming that we're even aware enough to, to, uh, to sort of comprehend them you know typically what we do is we just push them back into the background there and just (laughs) there they sit (laughs) Mm kind of like pulling the strings or steering the bus or whatever but uh but never given any uh any attention or any scrutiny yeah yeah and i just that's why i was so pumped to get you on here is because you don't just talk about surface shit you don't give people (laughs) you don't give people tactics you do at the end of the day you're going to be like and here's a few things you can do immediately yeah. but yeah. deep down you're getting people to reflect you're getting people to like dig deep and figure out okay why am i having this confidence issue which is you know standing in the way of what i'm trying to accomplish am i afraid am i uh is what's the roadblock here and it usually yeah. has to do with some relationship or something someone has told them in the past like the same way a mom could give a daughter in a, in a heat of anger, she could say something horrible and that daughter right. will carry that information to every relationship she goes through. You know, right. it's, it's that kind of stuff. Yeah. Well, yeah. that's and- why it's so important. We jump into our own hula hoop, so to speak, our own backyard, so to speak, and work on cleaning up the dog shit that's back there every <laughs> single solitary day. You know, I mean, we've got people out there coaching that don't even tap into their inner selves. They haven't oh. even addressed. And by the way, we don't com- ever completely heal. When we're completely healed is when we leave this awesome human body suit that we are in borrowed time <laughs> on. You know, it, it's, it's work in progress. It's a practice every single yeah. day. But, you know, the only, the only thing to do that is we've got to turn in, turn into our own backyards inside our own hula hoops whatever analogy you want to use but a lot of people don't do that you know we're moving at lightning speeds and we're distracted with all the bullshit that's going on here in the u.s not to mention around the world but more importantly right now in the u.s with the presidential election and all this fucked upness that we got going on but um, is, is that what that is oh, oh it's so- <laughs> We need to have a political show. Scott. All I'm saying is, uh, oh. you're you've been you've been like honestly, you've been trying to turn every show into a mini political <laughs> show, and I love it. But you've got the wrong host for that because I'm Canadian, and like I... my my prime minister, our prime minister just apologizes to everybody. Like, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Well, I don't think I don't know that that's a that that's a political process as much as it's like a like think about if you if you found the entrance, you know, the entrance to the gates of hell and, and you actually walked under the sign that said abandon all hope ye who enter here and you got to the first level. I think this is what would pass for entertainment there. 
Yeah. I think that what's <laughs> happening here, like any fucking day now, Donald Trump's mask is going to slip off a little bit <laughs> while he's, while he's, you know, <laughs> speaking on camera. And you're going to see a little bit of that wrinkled, bloody demon underneath yeah, who's just hair. mischievous and like, you know, oh my God, I don't know. The other day I was watching him and I could swear that they forgot to, to paint the chin strap of his toupee the same color as his skin. And I thought I saw the price tag there and everything. I was, was going like, to say oh that hair God. piece. That yeah, hair that's piece not hair. That's off. a fucking, it's a marmot. It's a marmot <laughs> that's been stunned and spray painted orange. And, uh, and they didn't even bother to like fasten it the right way. They just tied it with rope. <laughs> the, guy, the guy's a freak know, show. I the guy's know, a yes. freak so, show. Yeah. So tell us, uh, so now let's go to the other side here. And yes, Scott, okay. I just did flip this into a little bit of politics here. <laughs> you always so do. Talk, talk to me about Hillary Clinton then. I mean, come on. If you got your opinions about Trump, you got to have a little bit about Hillary. I do. I do. I think that since we're just freestyling here, honestly, I think Trump is the bait and switch. I don't know. Mm. What, here's, here's what a I don't believe. Do. A lot of here's what do. I do not believe. I do not believe that he is sincerely running a a presidential campaign. No, I don't, I don't I, believe it. I think, and that's why I joke that he's a fucking demon. Well, that and the fact that I'm reasonably sure you'd find little children skins in his attic. But um, <laughs> no, this. I'm so glad I swallowed that water before he said that. It would have been all over my desk. Here's a here's what I think. If you go back not too terribly far in 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 easily accessible public history, you'll see him and Hillary Clinton in photographs together as friends. Yeah. You can find you can find all kinds of proof of the fact that they were friends. Oh, and yeah. Yeah. here's what I say. If you're friends with Donald Trump, you're in business with Donald Trump. Yeah. If there's one yeah. thing the guy does, he's just one big walking back alley deal. You know well, what I mean? He, didn't he say that in the very one of the very first um, Republican um, debates this year that he had nothing against Hillary Clinton? He's been at parties and weddings with her and on the personal guest list. And he and and Trump used to be a Democrat at one time. He came over to be a Republican. <laughs> yeah. So, I mean, you know, they are friends. I mean, he is friends with the Clintons. So yeah, I think that that's that's pretty easily provable. And I, I honestly, honest to God, I think we're watching. I think P.T. Barnum is in heaven <laughs> with the biggest direction oh, he's had right now. This is the biggest bum hug in the world, man. This is a this is a humbug for sure. P.T. Barnum is definitely like just he can't oh he, he, he couldn't even roll out of bed because he's of how big that erection is. <laughs> yeah, he's creaming his celestial genes watching <laughs> this. He's like. The time that I got that bum to circle the block holding a brick is nothing compared to this. I don't know if you guys know your PT. Yeah, 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 yeah. Like the, the elephant tilling the garden by the train. This is yeah. so much bigger. Yeah. This is so, so much bigger. This is this is like theater of the absurd on the grandest scale. It's smoke yeah. and mirrors. It's misdirection. And I kind of think that, yeah, it's all to get Hillary into office. And I feel like we've had one legacy of presidents and that was enough. You know what I mean? I, I'm, yeah. I'm not thrilled with the way the Bush legacy played out, <laughs> <laughs> but I will honestly say that I, as a Canadian, like all I know is that my prime minister has really pretty hair, but I've been enjoying watching this whole thing because the one thing I've been noticing, it's not what he's saying. It's mm -hmm. what's happening as a result. Yes. Because, man, the media coverage, the magazine covers, the, you, oh, uh, my yeah. God. Oh, my yeah. God. Billions, billions of dollars in free publicity. So you want my snapshot as somebody who analyzes communication? Yes. yes. Oh, I okay. love this. Yes. Here's, here's what he's doing. If you break it down, which isn't that hard because it's so fucking simplistic, it's... I mean, yeah, people are all calling him a narcissist. And, and I honestly, I think that that might be true. I think that there might be some textbook narcissism there. But we, we live in, a, in the United States in particular. Our political system has been further and further sort of pushed into divisiveness for the last, what, 30 years, let's say. Beyond that, of course, right? But they really hit their stride, I would, I would say, after Reagan. I would say after Reagan is when um, they, they, 
political operatives really started to understand how to segment and divide people based on fear, based on rhetoric. And so now we've got the farthest right. I mean, fucking psychopaths, right? On the right-hand side who who have the most extreme views imaginable. And then on the left, it's it's the it's the polar opposite where it's just these these loud small segments of the population that don't represent the middle of the bell curve at all. Mm -hmm. uh, But they get the most, they get the most error because they're the loudest, right? Popularity contest. Yeah. Yeah. And if there's one thing that we've learned from PT Barnum is that there's a sucker born every minute and everybody loves a show. Yeah. Right. So, so here's what I think. I think that I'm not saying it was deliberate, but I think that in a way, the soil was tended with such care that it got to the point where we could have a, a, a um, presidential race like this one. People are so divided now that someone like Donald Trump can come up and all he has to do is guarantee you that there's no problem with how his dick works. All he has to do, I'm serious. All he yes. has to do is like mock the disabled reporter, right? And say mm-hmm. things like, you know, folks, you know what? I miss the old days, folks. You know what used to happen in the old days in a place like this? A person like that would get sent out on a stretcher. He should be fucking arrested for that. Yes. Yeah. That, yeah. Should, that, that, that should be illegal. But I you mean, know, though, Manny, that just goes to show you anyone can run for president here in the United States. I'm going to make Grace do it. I'm going to make my dog, my five-year-old black lab do it. Yeah. Um, no, anyone, and, you know, and that we true. can say and we can say anything. But that I mean, that is the beauty of America. I mean, we we have gotten I think our country is um She's nothing. This this country is nothing but like a big fucking whore. Seriously, she's laid down and has bed herself with freaking everyone and everything with the loosey goosey laws, the loosey goosey. um, Anyone can come into our country and live for years on end and not be um, and and not have dual citizenship or full blown citizenship. You've got um, Hillary Clinton who's betting herself. With, you know, large corporations outside the United States, including the Middle East, who hate us the most, but she's taking money. So that means if she's elected, they're going to have an opinion how this country is ran. Well, that's that's part of my point, actually. I don't think she could have done it on her own steam. No. Let's go go back to let's go back to when there were still other Republican candidates in the race. Right. I, I mean, and I'm good. <laughs> and I'm going to say something harsh here. <laughs> go for it. Really? Go for it. And then we got to plug your book. So go. Yeah. For it. All right. Let's do it. Let's do it. In fact, let's I take my harsh. book and, and plug the dike with it because this, this shit. <laughs> <laughs> um, no. So here's the thing. Like, even even when Mitt Romney was, was I, I don't know what he was doing. Oh, he God. Was, <laughs> Mitt Romney. Like, he was like, look at me. I'm a handsome puppet with great hair. Mm-hmm. But um, no, even back when it was Obama against Romney and Obama against McCain, there was what we thought then was a bit of insanity. But compared to the the candidates generated on the Republican side this time around, I'm thinking of the last debate where it had Cruz, it had Trump, it had uh, uh, the, what's that lady who looked... Oh, oh um, she was the CEO of, um, yes, yes. Yeah. Little yeah, tiny she, petite woman. Yes. Yeah. 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 Um, I forget so her name. Here's, here's what I do <clears throat> when I want to know what's going on. I I'll watch those political debates with the sound off because your body language, like, okay. <laughs> backing up yet another step. How do the people running for the president of the United States not know to train your body language to back up what you're saying? How has that missed them? This is amazing to me. Right? Because someone else is writing their speeches. <laughs> no, no, it doesn't matter though, Scott. It doesn't matter. See, yeah. if you're tr- if you're going for the highest office in the land, you spend 20 grand to make sure that your 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 candidate's message is on point with their body. Target yes. market, Manny. Target market. Yeah. I wouldn't help those people to save my life. <laughs> I, no, thanks. But seriously, no. so you turn the sound off and you watch and you got Ted Cruz, for instance. I'll never forget this. The guy's keeping his hands robot straight, right? Like he's trying to like do the robot. 
and, and he keeps talking and he's just like chopping the air with his hands. No way anybody's going to watch that and go, oh, I trust that guy. Oh, yeah. there's no, I, that, that, that was the first time he opened up his mouth. And I'm like, well, God, I mean, what does yeah. he have up his ass? This huge, uh, huge two by four or something. <laughs> I mean, come on. He talk about talk about news broadcaster. I mean, it very was robotic. Yeah, it's so it, very robotic. And every yeah. single person there. And in fact, I couldn't help but notice that Trump was the only spot of orange in an otherwise <laughs> off the sea. You know, I couldn't help but notice that either. So on so many subtle levels, I got to think that it was always going to be him so that he could distract from the fact that Hillary was sneaking into the White House pretty much. But that's but that's what I said from the very beginning. Yeah. I, in fact, I didn't think Trump was going to go this far. I thought he was going to make a lot of noise to do a lot of distraction from Clinton. Um, and uh, here, here we are, at, you know, down in Cleveland, Ohio. He's heading it all up down there. And, you know, so I eat my words a little bit. And I'm like, nope, he's going to go all the way here to pull some of those votes. And, and like you said, the distraction from Clinton. It's not you know? that he... He does not want the. He does not want her back in the White House, even though they are friends. He just does not want her. And quite frankly, and I'll say this live on the air: eight years ago, yes, I'm disappointed in her now. And you know yeah. what? Uh, Woohoo to our country! We now finally have a fucking woman up there running for president, and we also have a non-politician running for president. We got double history being made here. It's too bad that she felt she had to sell herself down a river somewhere because of her own um, uh, esteem and steam. And she's been preparing for that position since the day she graduated law school, more so than any other man has ever to step up to run for president. So does she deserve to be where she's at? Yeah, she's prepared for it. But man, I mean, and and listen, I don't have a problem having Billy Boy back in the um, White House, man. I, 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 you know, I don't have a problem. I don't have a problem. But, you know, I, she sold herself out. She really did. And I and, and it has nothing to do with this email bullshit. Can we get over this email bullshit? It's right, right. Who yeah. she's taking money from. She's taking money from the wrong people. Seriously, from the wrong people. So, yeah. no, I, I agree with that. I agree with all of it. Um, and I think that. I think that there's a fair chance that Trump is sitting there going, you know, I didn't expect to be here. I didn't expect yes. this to happen, but you know yeah. what? I make good deals. And so it's okay. Here's what yeah. I'm going to do, you know, yeah. but um, I seriously, I, I think that this is, this is a, a gargantuan clusterfuck. You know, <laughs> the inmates, the inmates are running the asylum at this point, and, yes. and I don't know. I am learning the, the, um, the Costa Rican national anthem just to be safe. Ooh, you know, so I was God, just there. I was just there. <laughs> Scott, I'm going to be bringing my family up to stay with you. Oh, till dude. This whole, yeah, till this whole Bring thing them. blows over. <laughs> There's a lot of Americans that are going to be knocking we on will. Scott's door. Yeah, it sounds like it. I, I, you know, famously Canadian over here. But I feel like I, we jam. Bring your family. We'll jam. We'll have, we, we'll have a good time. But speaking Excellent. about money coming from and going to the wrong places, I want to take a moment and talk about, you know, big things on the very, very near horizon and money going to the right places. Manny, mm, let's do the that. Bo- the book launch, the book, the launch, book the, launch, the charities, the the, the charities. way you you built this whole group of people who are just hungry to get causes supported and help your book get in the hands of people who need to read it. I'm so stoked. I've been watching in the background. I've been taking notes because awesome. I'm just I'm loving the way this is going. Tell us about it. What? Tell us about the book Totem, abbreviated into so, Totem, and yeah. tell us about the launch. <laughs> So the book is called The Tao of the Unbreakable Man. And I kind of feel like if you don't know what the word Tao means, you may not be the target market for the book, but it's, it's (laughs) Japanese, it's Japanese for the way. Um, and so that's, you know, it's like Taoism. Um, it, it really is the memoirs of my life. Uh, and for the first time I put a fragmented life into a, a sequential order and it was amazingly therapeutic for me. Because a lot of people who have um, high amounts of trauma in their life, their memories of their life, the way that they perceive their life is very schismed, very shattered. And uh, so for me, writing the book was the first time I threaded it all together. And it was 10 times more uh, healing than everything else I had done combined. I mean, it was just massive. And I wrote it deliberately 
I don't, you know, whether I succeeded or not will be, of course, ultimately up to the reader. But I deliberately wrote it so that it was like a personal improvement guide for someone who's not afraid to think. Someone mm-hmm. who doesn't necessarily want to have, you know, life tips just sort of handed to them on a silver platter. Because I don't think that there's any engagement. There's no skin in the game when you do it that way. And if there's one thing that that making positive change in our life takes, it's fucking grit. It's tenacity, you know, and I think that the personal improvement industry is focused too much on seven quick tips to change this nine quick hacks for this one weird trick for this, um, <laughs> which I mean, seriously, it's if you true. think about it, if you think it. about it, the impl- the implication is we got this for you, right? Yeah. Yep. You don't have to do the work to change your own fucking life. Come on. It's you disgusting. Know. I ain't buying that. You're we, 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 we bitch about that every episode, dude. Oh, like, yeah. We bitch yeah. so hard about that. So it's the personal accountability piece, right? And and hopefully, I mean, it may have been a pie in the sky idea. We'll see. But hopefully people will read that. And, and uh, what I will say, Kim, more for you because you don't know this. And this moves me beyond my ability to express it. But people who have pre-read it, Virtually everyone who has pre-read it has gotten back to me and said, you made me cry. Oh, wow. I can't wait to get my hands on it, Manny. You know, you made me cry at this part. I can't believe that you are who you are now after being gone. So the... The the early feedback is just astronomical. I mean, and I don't, I'm not bragging here. You know, I'm so glad that I get to be able to say that to you. So when's um, the launch day? When 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 are it, you launching the book? When can people, can you announce that now or? I, yeah, yeah, oh, yeah. Okay. It was submitted this morning. Okay, awesome. Nice. So awesome. I don't have the links yet because I haven't got full approval yet. It, it, it goes, you know, Amazon, it has to sort of uh, process into their rep, their inventory worldwide. Mm-hmm. And that apparently that takes some time. I, I'm, mm-hmm. I'm learning these things as I go. <laughs> yeah. But anyway, so, so Kim, I'll put you in the group and, you know, Please. everybody listening, there's a Facebook group called Totem Book Launch. And I want to, I want to clarify, Totem is an acronym. So it's capital T-O-T-U-M, T-O-T-U-M. Just ask for permission to join that group. I'll put you in it and you'll know everything. You know, the the group will probably uh, stay around long after the book launches so that I can communicate with the the people that are, are part of the charity stuff and, and things like that. So, Scott, you asked about the charities. Here's the idea I came up with. Anybody who thinks that they can drive some sales of the book, I will take 100% of the profits – from any physical copy you sell and I'll give them to the charity, either of my choosing or your choosing. And so that's how that works. Anybody who's got a a tribe, anybody who's got people, you know, and you feel like you can influence decision, it would be a great, a great opportunity for you because, you know, it goes to the charity that, uh, that you like, or, or like in Scott's case, you hand it to me and I, I'm probably just going to stick with the boys and girls clubs. I love it. Yeah. The, I'll be honest, the charity part is what really, that's where you got me. That's where I was like, yeah. you know what, this man is after my own heart. He deals with youth organizations. He's selling a book that's going to help pretty much anyone who picks it up. And he's he's yeah. not even pocketing the money. He's giving it away. Like, my God, yeah. Manny. <laughs> that is awesome. Beautiful. So, um, Manny, I've requested to be in the group. And the day of the launch, count on me to do some promoting and things like that um, to help you get that book to the bestseller and drive some sales in to um, donate to the Boys and Girls Club, which is an awesome, awesome, awesome club. And I can't wait to get my hands on that. Uh, you know, thank you for, you know, books and these radio shows, you know, as we broadcast live, they're also being recorded for those who can't listen at the time. They have to post listen they have shelf life there's yeah. shelf lives on this stuff and you know whether we are not i'm a very slow reader and sometimes when i get a book in my hands i like to it's almost like a piece of caramel that you put in your mouth and you just mill that caramel around i like to do that sometimes with some books and i cannot wait to get my hands on your on your book uh, i'm so excited for you i really am and kudos to you for putting everything down into words because you will know some and you will not know all of people Mm. that you are inspired with those words. That's, you know, that's a great, that's a great thought. I hadn't really 
thought of that. But what I will say to you is I love your analogy of a piece of caramel because when I first started writing the book, I found that over and over again, I would use these derivative voices from my favorite authors, my favorite writers, you know, so the first draft sort of sounded like um, uh, Kurt Vonnegut Jr., you know, and then the second draft sounded a little bit like Mark Twain. And I'm like, what the <laughs> fuck am I doing? You know, <laughs> why do I keep sounding like the guys who I admire and the girls who I admire? And so I finally found my own voice and my own voice with writing is very much like you described. I want you like I pay attention to the way that the words sort of roll together. You know, um, if, if uh, you're going to love it. I'm just going to say that with yeah. confidence. If that's something that you like about a book, you're going to love this. So Okay, so let's do this. Sorry, Scott. I mean, to, I mean, I'm going to jump in. Here. Let's no do worries, this real no quick. Worries. Is Everyone heard of what the Facebook group is to go on in there and request and joining. Manny, also to tell everybody how they can get in touch with you. If they don't want yeah. to belong in a Facebook group, then they can maybe get on an email list or at least connect with you. Absolutely. So my website is really hard to find. It's mannywolf.com. <laughs> <laughs> it's uh, just M-A-N-N-Y, Manny, um, not M-A-N-I, not anything, you know, it's very phonetic. And But wolf has an E at the end. So it's M-A-N-N-Y-W-O-L-F-E.com. And if you want to shoot me an email, just shoot it to Manny at MannyWolf.com. I, I, I can't imagine how I could have made it easier. <laughs> I love it. I love it. Yeah, Manny I, Wolf, man. Melts in your mouth, not in your hands like caramel. There you go. <laughs> oh, I love that. The M&Ms. Peanuts are plain. It. What can we say? You know, hey. um, well, we are way past our allotted um, time here. But since I'm one of the owners of the station, <laughs> fuck it. We can go past our time. <laughs> <laughs> Poor Nesh has got somewhere else to be. I know it. He's sitting there right, quietly right. behind his computer, <laughs> oh, gritting no. his teeth. <laughs> oh no, he left. He went to go get us more beer. Are you kidding? Uh, <laughs> he went to the refrigerator, please. Um, All right. Anyways, oh my God, Manny, thank you so much for joining us today. I'm sorry we got to cut this. You know, we're past the hour here. Um, I'm looking forward to the book. Um, when again does the book? When do you plan on bringing the book out? To you, do you we're, know yet or? An estimated yes. time. Yes, we're really hoping for Friday. Oh, oh my God! Of this week? Yeah, yeah. Two days. Uh, oh, so holy crap. okay. For, uh, this is going to mean nothing to people listening to this a year from now. <laughs> <laughs> it's coming out Friday. <laughs> okay, so, for you people that are listening to it from a year from now, get your asses over to Amazon, goddamn, and buy the book. <laughs> yeah, that's right. <laughs> so, for those of us in real time, just a. a, a I got to I got to share this because it's so amazing. Uh my fiance is obsessed with things that have sentimental value. And she is such a good balance for me because that that stuff just goes right by me. It's not that I don't value it, it's just that I'm so focused on the whole like work progress contribution thing that I let those little important moments slip by, but she she tethers that. So Friday will be our anniversary. Oh, oh. Nice. yeah. Yeah. And so that's why I tried to orchestrate it so that the official launch would be on Friday. Oh, well, hell, I Jeez. can't wait. I'm excited for you. I um <laughs> can't wait to get out there and do some promoting on my social media platforms for you and get a book and let's, let's get this to bestseller and get this book into a lot of people's hands and let's help a lot of, you know, let's help the boys and girls at the boys and girls club. Cause it's an amazing organization. So yeah, it really is. Manny, thank Love you it. so much. Um, Scott, thanks for um, leading the way today and letting me sit on back as uh, Ginger Rogers that I am. <laughs> Howard Stern, I don't know. Howard Sterness, you know, whatever. <laughs> I don't know. Before I love we close it, the show I up, it. I want to really quickly give a huge shout out. Um, Scott, she was a guest. Chris Kelly was a guest on our show a yes. few weeks ago. And um, I adore Chris Kelly. I only know Chris. She's in L.A. I only know Chris from social media. And um, we got so much pain and hurt going on in our country and not to mention around the world. I'm, I'm, I'm not demising what's going on from around the world with what happened in France. A lot of bullshit that went down last week in the United States. And Chris. Chris is constantly out there. She um, 
She birthed the Chris Kelly Foundation. Reach out, get connected with Chris Kelly. Um, take a look at the Chris Kelly Foundation. They just found a dog in the San Bernardino um, uh, uh, mountains field somewhere out in the, I, I'm not familiar with San Bernardino. And he's an older small dog that was deaf and blind, was covered in fleas and ticks. And she feels they've rescued him. They've got him safe and sound. I feel so bad for this old little guy, but she feels that someone might probably died and another family member just dumped him in a, in a field. So they have found this poor little old dog that's deaf and blind. This is the work that Chris Kelly does out in um, the L.A. area. So people, please reach out, open up your hearts, um, give her a thumbs up, support her, open up your wallets, something. I wanted to give a big shout out because we are such a painful society, not only to ourselves, not only to other people, but to um, these beautiful four-legged um, uh, animals that we have uh, in our lives. So yeah, Chris, and I love thanks. Chris because she let me say cockfight on the air. So. <laughs> she, did. she did. That's right. We got to do some tweeting about that. But hey, guys, um, get out there, make it a great day, um, Manny. I am um, now. I'm have something to look forward to on Friday. I'm besides an ice cold beer. I'm really excited. I am just. On the edge of my seat, cannot wait. I'm in the group, and you've approved me, and I will watch for all of that and help you promote the hell up out of that book. Thank you so much for everything, for that, for having me here, for letting it just – letting it rip like we did. Yeah, it's been great. Yep. If you could all just sit tight in the green room here at Bold Radio Station, and we're going to get Mr. Nesha, who's been serving us beer for the last hour. He'll close up the show. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you, guys. I'm surrounded by men today. Oh, I love it. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> Join love, us right back here next week. Scott and I, we're going solo next week. You don't want to miss that. Have a great day, everybody. Cheers.